Kyle Sondland and Herbert Konings are founding partners of Security Token Group. All opinions expressed by them or guests on this podcast are solely their opinions and do not represent the views of Security Token Group or its subsidiaries. You should not take any opinion expressed on the show as a specific inducement to make a particular investment or follow any investment strategy. This podcast is for informational purposes only. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Security Token Show, Episode 10. My name is Kyle Sondlin, and I'm here with my co-host, Herwig. Hi, everyone. My name is Herwig Konings, and you heard that right. Episode 10, double digits, Kyle. Very Woo! exciting. Let's go. Actually, I, I was doing a little bit of research, Kyle, and uh, at least as far as I know, we are the longest-running podcast in the security token space. You love to hear it. It's not something we're going to give up anytime soon. No, certainly not. Count on it, listeners. We'll be coming back to you every single week with the latest insights, news, and information around the security token space. And this week's episode, International Exchanges, where we'll go on a global tour of all the exchanges listed outside of the U.S. with an expectation of coming to market either already or in the near future. But first, as always, the news. Let's get into it. So first off, Kyle, I want to let you know here about Kavita Gupta. And if you haven't heard of her before, she is the former Consensus Ventures head. And now she has joined the Dusk Network. If you recall, we did a little bit of a synopsis of the Dusk Network in last week's episode. But ultimately, this is more uh, about Gupta here, who will be serving as the chairwoman of the company's non-executive board while continuing to teach as a professor at Stanford University. She mentioned in the article that she identifies Dusk as one of the leading players and believes STOs will specifically solve the gap in capital markets for private companies raising their larger rounds before they are forced to IPO. Definitely a a powerful addition to the Dusk Network team, and we'll be looking to see what uh, news comes out from that. Yeah, it's a great move for them. I know that the Dusk Network, certainly their community, is very outspoken in the space they're always being very engaging through social media and through all of the different platforms. And, and so I'm excited to see what they keep doing. They're making good acquisitions of talent and certainly are not, not stopping one bit. So let's see what they can do and, and, and move forward this space. They're, they're making waves, Kyle. And I can only infer a non-executive board as essentially an advisory board, right? Presumably. So, you know, it's always very important to have great advisors listed to projects, especially new ones coming to market. And getting Kavita Gupta as the former head of of Consensus Ventures is certainly a big win. Moving on, we're going to talk a little bit about the Australian Securities Exchange, which recently announced a partnership with VMware and Digital Asset. Presumably, they're going to be using VMware's distributed ledger technology with the guidance of Digital Asset to integrate their entire stock exchange on chain. Now this is no small feat because the Australian Securities Exchange, which launched in 2015 by the way, already has two trillion in registered securities in their market and almost $5 billion in daily volume. No small amount. And this is obviously a big step that the ASX is doing. And one could presume that maybe they will also leverage this technology one day for tokenized securities. It's great for implementing all of the data feeds that they're leveraging for all of these securities that they're offering, as well as we've seen Vanguard has, has experimented with, with this technology for their ETFs. And so it's, it's just more great work from, from these larger securities exchanges to try to implement this technology, which, as you said, hopefully will lead us into a, you know, the, the larger adoption of, of security tokens around the world. Very exciting. And another exchange also made a big announcement, Merge. If you recall, listeners, they are the Seychelles-based security token exchange. Last few weeks and months really talking up their Merge IPO, where they'll be listing shares of the company directly on their exchange. And it looks like they are partnering with a company called Globacap out of the UK to issue those tokens. Now, for those of you who don't know, Globacap is actually an FCA sandbox approved company, and they were actually one of the first companies, if not the first issuance of tokens through the FCA with sandbox approval. For that, and really only learning this uh, just for this episode, Kyle, I'm gonna give Globacap my company of the week because it's always great to see yet another FCA approved 
issuer and it's on me for not having been aware of them already and you know through some research it certainly seems like they're a very strong issuance platform and they have made a great partnership with here with merge to to be their issuance partner so very exciting and, and congrats to you global cap awesome work yeah working with with as many institutional clients as they can and, and they're starting to scale and, and kudos to the fca for continuing to to help these companies really thrive in regulation and be able to do things compliantly. And so awesome work, Globacap, and, and I wholeheartedly agree with you, Herwig. And we're going to keep this news around foreign exchanges. Just happens to also be our topic going here. We have the Liechtenstein-based digital asset exchange Block Trade recently being acquired by Cryptix AG. For those of you who don't know, Cryptix AG is a Swiss-based DLT blockchain services provider, and they have acquired Block Trade for an undisclosed sum. Uh, however, we do know from Block Trade that they expect this acquisition to help them with improved talent, helping them build out the platform, and also, very important, speeding up their regulatory approval so that they can trade tokenized securities in the EU. Next up, I do have to do a little bit of a disclosure. Uh, this news is about a company called Invest Ready and Vertalo. I myself am one of the founders of Invest Ready and the chairman of the board. So I do want to disclose this uh, so that you're, you're certainly not biased about whenever I talk about Invest Ready on this episode or, or any in the future. But this is an exciting one, Kyle. I'm very happy about this one. Vertalo, another leader in the issuance space here in the U.S., has chosen Invest Ready as their integration partner for, for investor accreditation, one of those compliance pieces that's very important here in the U.S., and this is also after a sum of news recently from Invest Ready, including partnerships with Crowd Engine, one of the largest white label crowdfunding providers in the space, as well as Prime Trust, you know, another major player in the space, choosing Invest Ready as their uh, accreditation provider. And already Invest Ready services Securitize and many others in the space. So it's really looking great uh, that InvestReady is really thrusting itself in the space as, as a leader in investor accreditation for digital securities. I have a, a sort of overview article next up for you here, listeners, about EB-5s. So for those of you who don't know, the EB-5 program is a program here in the U.S. designed to allow foreign investors to invest in a U.S. opportunity that essentially creates jobs. And as a result of doing so, they can earn themselves a green card that allows them to take residence here in the United States. It's been a very popular program, Kyle, and there are dirt, certainly a lot of nu nuances to it. There are, you know, you have specific lockup periods about how long they need to hold the investment. They have to produce a certain number of jobs in certain regions. And a whole industry has sort of formed around helping foreign investors identify opportunities go through the prospective you know, uh, green card requests with immigration, and of course, complete and manage the investment. And one of those big issues is because of all these kind of nuances and because this is not necessarily about ROI, but more so about getting a green card, <laughs> uh, the, these investments typically aren't always um, managed in a way that is best desirable. And so therefore, if you apply tokenization technology to it, of course, it makes it a little bit easier to track but it also may create liquidity potential down the line when EB-5 investments are ready for that transfer because, again, because they're not ROI-focused necessarily, most investors may not necessarily be looking to stick it out. So even though this isn't talking about bringing up a new exchange designed around EB-5 investments, no, it's security token technology, making it easier to create liquidity, to manage this process and, and track investors. So... I think this is a great overview that you can go and read on Crowdfund Insider. And again, all of this news is sourced from stomarket.com slash news. So if you hear any articles that we're talking about today, certainly go check out the description from wherever you're listening to, and I'm sure you'll find the article we're talking about. However, that's it, Kyle. That's all I have for you today in the news. So I'd love to pass it on to you and learn more about the latest in the security token offerings. Yeah, it's super interesting to hear you talking about the EB-5 investments because we actually have later in the STO section of the podcast here actually something very similar in a different jurisdiction. So I think it fits in very well later. Um, but you're totally right. If you want to participate in submitting articles to the podcast, if you want to be able to hear more or read more about anything we talk about or 
read the comments of people that are discussing these articles or see ones that maybe we couldn't quite fit into the weekly episode because we do see a, a large amount of, of articles submitted. So if you want to go check all of that stuff out, go on stomarket.com slash news. You can also send things directly to Herwig and I via Twitter or LinkedIn. Um, we have all of those links in the description um, on YouTube or Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Podbean, Google Podcasts, literally anywhere you want to listen to it. It's all there. So definitely check that out. Reach out to us and send us anything you think is interesting. We are everywhere, Kyle. We're everywhere. We're everywhere. We're the largest podcast here in the space, and and we're really seeing great feedback from the community. So we really appreciate that from everyone around the world. Now, digging into the security token offering news, we have something really big, Herwig. There was a huge announcement from our friends at Smartlands. And Smartlands is in the U.K., and they had a, a tremendous success in the security token industry because they actually were able to fill a full round for their real estate security token offering. And so Smartlands raised capital from private investors to buy 30% of the Winrise One Limited, which is a property of 124 newly constructed studio apartments specifically targeting students at a few local universities in Nottingham. And so they have an investment period of three years, and it's paying back in, in kind of a, a return on capital, looking at 47% over those three years. You're looking at about 15% annualized each year over that period. And they were incredibly successful with the offering. They not only built the, the structure itself and fully sold out all 124 studio apartments to students, which accurately demonstrates all of the interest from the actual students and the fact that it was a good property, but they fully sold out the investment opportunity from their private investors and are going to be issuing a security token that's going to generate revenue. And so this is just a, a fantastic opportunity. That is awesome, Kyle. You know, real estate is something we've often talked about as the likely first most adopted use case for security tokens. And this one is textbook from my perspective. You have a very strong underlying asset. It's secured. It's offering a very interesting double-digit return. And of course, again, it's real estate. It's a, it's a good property. All 124 units are currently occupied in what is considered to be a fast-growing student housing space in the U.K., And I'm sure Smartlands will continue to do more deals like this based on this success. Really, really great. Yeah, it's fantastic. I think we've seen a few security token real estate projects thus far that haven't quite worked out exactly the way that that many had hoped for. And so to see one that, that is incredibly successful was nothing that was incredibly overbearing. It's not something huge, some crazy large hotel somewhere or something insane. It's it's a really moderate real estate offering in a in in what we might not consider as one of the largest hubs certainly even in in just the UK but let alone the world and yet it was unbelievably successful and so because of that I'm actually going to give Smartlands my company of the week I think they did a great job in determining strong demand for the real estate property they were successfully able to fill the full round quickly showing that there was incredible thoughtfulness in structuring the offering There's a strong promotional push from them to help move the industry forward by setting a great example for issuance platforms in the space. And as I said, it's exciting because this shows a lot of promise for real estate around the world. If you can show a strong interest for your property, no matter what size, this can be done and this can be fundraised and this can be incredibly successful for investors that are interested in generating solid returns around the world. And so congratulations to them and, and Nottingham's interesting and we'll see what, what other properties they're able to do moving forward. Kyle, I think that's a really great choice, man. Um, at the end of the day, this is what it's all about and you just mentioned something a little earlier which is that not all real estate STOs have been received uh, as well despite us saying here that we think it's you know going to be the first adopted and I think this Smartlands announcement is really big because I'm going to call one out in particular and only because it's very similar to this. The Harbor STO for the, I believe it was North Carolina student housing project was a big, big debacle, right? It failed and constantly in the news, you see this being referenced as something that is slowing down the industry or hindering when when all accounts, it was just one deal that went bad and who knows why. 
and other real estate projects will, will suffer the same fate the same way others will also succeed just like with this Smartlands offering. So hopefully now the news is going to start talking about this successful offering as opposed to that failed one. Yeah, so congratulations to that team. I'm sure that there was an incredible amount of hard work to bring this to fruition and and uh, it's just tremendous for the industry. So congratulations to them. That's my company of the week. Now, moving forward into what I had teased a little bit earlier is, is the La Estancia security token offering. And so with the La Estancia real estate project, they're actually promoting this as a great way to get citizenship and a green card, maybe not citizenship, but a green card rather, to the Dominican Republic by investing in this real estate property. So very similar to the US, but I think it maybe is a little bit less restrictive in terms of where you're allowed to invest. You can actually participate in this offering. And as long as you are investing, you know, the, the $200,000 minimum that is required, it actually can result in you generating a green card for the Dominican Republic successfully through a security token offering and then be able to liquidate that properly moving forward. So a lot of what you had referenced in terms of this EB-5 exemption is, is, is here in a security token offering for the Dominican Republic. Um, and it's they're raising right now $75 million from qualified and institutional investors only. And so as long as the investor is also compliant with application requirements, medical exams, and pays the application fees, they will receive residency status in a matter of weeks, and that's according to the um, head of blockchain strategy at La Estancia, Laurent Kemla or Shemla. And so he mentions that the investor will get a full citizenship and a Dominican Republic passport in two years, independent of the original investment, as long as they've been compliant with the country's laws during that time. So they actually get full citizenship. I was not kidding or wow. mistaken when I had said that earlier. They, according, to, uh, according to Laurent, they, they will have full citizenship um, in two years' time following their, their investment of $200,000. They, they just took the EB-5 and, and took it up a notch. Oh, <laughs> wow, that's awesome. So, a really neat trend. You're not kidding. So uh, I'm sure we'll see other countries start to highlight the same. And you're right. This is proof that tokenized EB-5-type investments, or let's call them citizenship investments, is possible and, and makes sense. And I'm sure we'll see a, a trend of this on the rise in the future. Yeah, so it's here. So if that, that interests you, if that's something that you think is you'd be able to take advantage of or you're interested in, definitely go check out La Estancia, reach out to that team and figure out how you can get involved. Or, and join the great nation of the Dominican Republic. Amen, amen. You wouldn't be too far from us here in Miami, Florida. So moving forward in our last security token offering of the day, we have Cryotech Nordic. And... This is something that I was, I was able to find. Somebody mentioned it to me, and there wasn't a ton of information on the structuring of this deal, which makes me think that maybe they're trying to test the waters. They're trying to see what demand might be, figure out if this is something that they want to move forward with. But Cryotech Nordic is looking to create cryotherapy, physical therapy operations and make them more accessible to the general public for physical therapy, for rehab, rehabilitation, all of that kind of thing. Um, I've never used it myself, but but certainly um, a lot of people swear by it. And so they're looking to fundraise to provide cheaper, more accessible options for this type of solution. Um, so if you're interested, definitely go check them out. Unfortunately, again, there wasn't a ton of information from me to find out much about this operation, whether they're looking to keep it international or be in the U.S. or, or what kind of investors were were you know, being played around with in terms of what they were looking to do. Um, but definitely be sure that if they decide to proceed with this, I will keep you updated on what that offering looks like and we'll, we'll do a little bit of a follow-up there. Finally, we also have the market update. So we're taking a look at some of our secondary trading offerings. And like in, in previous weeks, we really only have a great update on T0's preferred equity token at this point. Um, it is a little bit delayed just because it is a holiday weekend here in the United States. So the reality is, Herwig, with T0 is that they're working with an institutional financial services provider that is only open on Monday through Friday, 9 to 5 EST, and is closed on federal holidays. So 
Uh, I logged in this morning and I couldn't even get market data, Kyle. <laughs> they, they, not only did they turn off the the exchange itself, but you can't even see the pricing data. Yeah, interesting you can't move. see historical information. It's all gone. It, it's kind of an odd user experience. I, I'm sure you felt the same way. I, I did. <laughs> but that being said, we do have a little bit of information. And wow, there was some drama. T0... Their price is dropping. Their price is at $2.20 right now, or I guess at close on Friday, which is a 20, almost a 25% drop in 24 hours from Thursday. And we're seeing over a 50% drop from when it was first opened to retail investors no more than a month ago. So clearly this shows that the retail demand for this preferred equity token is waning. It also shows that there's a lot of criticism of potentially T0 and you know overstock and all of that other drama I'm sure is playing a part in this. And then finally, I think that people are frustrated that we don't have any other assets to trade on the T0 exchange. This has certainly been a long time coming to have their equity. Their competitor here in the US, Open Finance, has five or six live tokens trading. And so I think that there's definitely some question marks around the efficiencies there because we're still only looking to trade T0 equity. And what's the equity worth if they don't have anything else to trade? So right. um, so it's very interesting. It's something that we definitely will need to keep watching. I have confidence in, in T0 as an exchange. They, they have a ton of institutional connections and a lot of capital behind them. Um, but they, you know, the investors are certainly getting a little antsy, I think. Um, and, and also maybe a little bit frustrated because at this point, T0 is, is 78% below its primary offering price. They sold it at 10 bucks a share. It's now at 220 So maybe you can understand how investors are feeling a little bit right now. Yeah, I, I, I don't know what else to say other than things rebound and, and I wish the best for them. And I, I think you're right. News like, hey, there are new offerings, there are new opportunities to invest in would expect a correlation to drive the, the price of the T0 token up. Uh, but uh, with little activity, it's hard to judge. So we'll see. The reality is the security token market cap is still doing okay. We're looking at it's just under $135 million. At this point, it is down 4 or 5% from the 140 or so million figure that we saw last week. But... Uh, Again, this also does not include many of the successful security token offerings that we've talked about over the last 10 weeks. So once these guys start to get some liquidity in, in the Smartlands offering or one of these other various offerings that have been incredibly successful, I think we'll see a lot more. That being said, I think it's, a, it's an interesting transition into our later topic about those international exchanges. So we'll have to get into that. But before we do, Herwig, do we have some upcoming events coming up soon? We do, actually, Kyle. I'm happy to share with everyone here. As we've been saying for the last couple episodes, there is still the chance to attend the event in Singapore hosted by Crowd on digital securities on September 6th. So if you want to check that out, again, all these events are in our links in the description. And there's still a chance to go, to go check that one out. There's another one starting in October 3rd and 4th called Fintech 2020 in Washington, D.C. This is run by Sidney Armani. I've known him for a long time. He's been putting events together in the crowdfunding space for, for a very long time. And I myself will also be speaking there. So nice. if you're attending, yeah, reach out. Let me know. Well, I'd love to grab a beer or catch up and learn what you're working on. That's D.C.? That's D.C., Kyle, on October 3rd and 4th. Washington, D.C. Cool. The, the next one is World Blockchain STO Summit in Dubai, which is on October 21st. Another international one here that looks to be a, a big one. So learn more about that to see if it makes sense to, to attend. The last one I want to share with everyone where Kyle and I will both be speaking, actually, is Crypto Ops 2019, also on October 21st. So pick your battles here, folks, <laughs> and which one you're going to go to. Uh, if you choose New York City, though, of course, please reach out. We're setting up meetings. We'd love to connect. But that's it. That's all I have. I think we're ready to move on to this main topic here on international exchanges. And this was actually incited by an article that we won't cover too much, but it was created by Token Market and a very good synopsis of how the jurisdictions across the world are, are looking at STOs and preparing and adapting 
Over the last month or two, we've been talking about how the definition of securities and tokenized securities are, are being defined by regulators everywhere. Uh, and this is a great article that does a, a good synopsis of it. But really, we figured it might be useful for everyone to dive in even further, get even more coverage because this article doesn't cover everything that's happening, and more importantly, talk about what really matters, which is the exchanges coming to market in those jurisdictions, expecting to compete in the capital market level. But before we jump into what, what I'll call the world tour, Kyle, <laughs> uh, I think it's worth mentioning you know, why this, this topic is so important and right. why this technology and the concept of tokenized exchanges, specifically being international, is so important for capital markets today. The first one, I think, is you know, more or less obvious, which is that there is now a new market uh, for that's in a foreign jurisdiction where an asset could get listed. So let me give you an example where last week, I believe Kyle mentioned that INX is doing an IPO. Uh, and INX is actually, I believe, out of uh, Gibraltar. And they are doing an F1 IPO in the United States. And that is them and raising $130 million. So that's a perfect example of a company who is looking outside their jurisdiction to try and find at least in this case, primary investors and liquidity for their assets. And we can expect that this trend will continue as more and more international exchanges pop up all around the world. You now have issuers seeing that they can tap into new pools where obviously the New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ are very prohibitive for 99% of businesses. You have other regions like the Euronext and other exchanges around the world that have found a home for different types of commodities, currencies, or different specific assets. And now we will see even more exchanges become available for those issuers, maybe tapping into new asset classes that couldn't find liquidity on any exchange previously before, or simply making it easier to list foreign in a foreign jurisdiction, and therefore the compliance or the costs, et cetera, is reduced. And it makes sense to then go ahead and actually, instead of listing in your home country, actually do a, a foreign listing. Definitely. The next one I think is also worth mentioning, of course, is the reverse side of that. You have the issuers looking at foreign jurisdictions. Now you have the investors. You just gave a great example in this episode, Kyle, where you could go and invest in a student housing real estate project in the UK. You could go and invest... Uh, based on the La Estacencia, you know, into an opportunity into the Dominican Republic. Constantly every week, we're giving you examples of new foreign investment opportunities, not necessarily always available to the U.S., but the point being that you now, as an investor, as a result of international tokenized exchanges, have more access and easier access to new investment opportunities, new ROI, new alpha uh, which is always a good thing to make global capital markets more efficient. This is also important on secondary markets. And a lot of investors today are really bound by the jurisdiction for secondary trading of traditional securities based off of their local jurisdiction. It is very difficult to buy or sell equities from outside jurisdictions than the one that you are located in. You need to leverage OTC desks or many other kind of roundabout solutions and it's not quite as easy as just going on you know your brokerage site and buying something from the South Korean stock exchange that's just that doesn't work as effectively as one might be for buying in their local jurisdiction and so for investors primary investment as well as secondary investment accessing it internationally is, is incredibly valuable major additionally I think that the we're talking about jurisdiction interoperability. So being able to invest around the world and be able to raise capital around the world is also valuable for the third piece of the puzzle, which is the regulations and the institutions themselves. And so the, the really key development in security tokens is the rea reality that when tokenized securities are standardized across these jurisdictions, it would allow for partnerships between exchanges with each other or exchanges themselves actually getting licensed in multiple jurisdictions in order to allow for their audience of investors as well as allowing them to gain a larger audience of investors to participate which were previously not accessible to them and and we're starting to see that we can break down these centralized financial barriers 
to allow for exchange-free asset exchange inside and outside of a jurisdiction. And so as long as we're establishing what these things are and making it clear what a security is and who's allowed to invest and quantify those things properly, there seems to be no reason why we can't have this interoperability between all of these different exchanges and all of these different regulatory bodies to be able to, to improve the experience for all investors. Couldn't agree more, Kyle. You know, I guess the difference between the two examples are it's one thing for now anyone in the U.S. or in the U.K. to be able to go and invest in Singapore directly. It's another to be able to go to your existing financial institution in your home country and have them purchase and buy in Singapore. It's, it's a much more efficient system. It's going to be much more regulatory compliant, and it is, it is making the process easier. It's probably more difficult to have to be a foreigner going into one of these exchanges, regardless of the fact that it's now a digital process. So I think it's a really good highlight. And with that, I think we've set the stage for us to go and travel the globe, and we'll start right here in Europe. Where I, you know, for those of you listening, I'm from Belgium, so I think this is great for me to cover this region. And we're going to start with what, what is likely seen as the most progressive jurisdiction, the UK. Easily, you know, because of their FCA sandbox and because of all the approvals on token market, token E2030, global cap, smart lands, you know, you're getting tons of issuances coming out of that region. Uh, and it, it means that there's going to be a lot of activity to be expected on the secondary side. However, it doesn't seem like there are any major exchanges, let's call it startup entrants, such as T0 and the equivalent in the US, in the, in the UK. So the, the major one that really is making moves is the London Stock Exchange, uh, which has announced a deal to list the 2030 shares worth around $3 million, And they'll be listed, uh, expected sometime around next year after their lockup expires. So that's great news to see you know, the institutional exchange working with these issuance platforms to go ahead and find liquidity. It's, it's certainly much harder to develop a marketplace uh, and much, much easier to, to work with an existing one and optimize it around your instrument. Are the 2030 shares tokenized? Are you aware of, of what yes. those shares? So they're they tokenized are, they're shares? Tokenized that... shares approved by the FCA that will be listed on the, on the London Stock Exchange. And so that's cool. That's big news. As far as we know, that will be the first example of that on, on really any uh, exchange to date so far. Uh, I'm sure actually that one will sneak in there beforehand depending on lockup situations, but th- I think that's a major deal. Uh, Moving on, the next kind of biggest jurisdiction, I think, making a name for itself, Kyle, is, of course, Malta. Malta is home to some major players, and Malta has kind of redefined itself as blockchain islands. They put out the VFA regulations. They recently put out another one around security tokens. And Binance, as well as OKX Exchange, OK Exchange, have both done public partnerships with the Malta Stock Exchange to trade security tokens. And we know there's a lot of activity from issuance platforms like New Fund, Black Manta, and many more that are looking to, to find liquidity through the Malta jurisdiction. And Binance and OKX are two major cryptocurrency exchanges, right? Super large and Huge volume. volume. So at the end of the day, this is a similar concept of you're not making a brand new marketplace and Binance doing billions in revenue certainly has the capacity to put a lot of resources into, into developing this out with in partnership with the Malta Stock Exchange. So that's going to be super exciting when that happens. We're all you know keeping a close eye on the island of Malta to see announcements from these exchanges about when they'll be live and which assets will be listed. And of course, we hope to be sharing that information with you weekly on our podcast. Next up, traveling over to Switzerland. The Swiss Stock Exchange launched the the SDX, the Swiss Digital Exchange. Again, this is their institutional national stock exchange that is looking at security tokens with great intensity. They partnered with R3 to start bringing everything on chain and using a a specific distributed ledger technology that will be compliant with their regulations. And as a national exchange, once again, we expect to see big moves happening from this. It is a subdivision that they're launching out, but we know that they're already working with with debt instruments and one can expect to certainly see some of the major projects or or projects we haven't heard of yet look to list on the, the SDX. 
Last week, I did announce that their CEO, or two weeks ago, I'm not sure I don't remember, stepped down. Uh, so they probably still have some ways to go before hmm. that's actually going to be happening. I feel like most of these exchanges have a ways to go still before we really do see that. That is definitely volume. the trend. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the same can go for Gibraltar, which is home to two exchanges. The Gibraltar Blockchain Exchange and INX, which I just mentioned to you, is, is doing the IPO here in the U.S., Global uh, Gibraltar Block Exchange raised $27 million uh, in order to go ahead and, and launch their platform, and uh, all eyes are on them to, for them to go live. And of course, INX is raising around $130 million in their IPO, so that gives you a, a little bit of a, you know implication on the, the size that they're going for here. But once again, both are not live and trading security tokens, so it's hard to infer much more. I think this next one's really interesting, Kyle, out of France here. Uh, another institutional stock exchange. This one actually happens to be the sixth biggest exchange in the world by market cap. Obviously, uh, you know, the New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ are bigger, but ultimately it's the same company, ICE, that also owns the New York Stock Exchange and the Euronext Exchange, which is why I find this so interesting. And Euronext made headlines when they announced that they are investing in issuance platform Tokeny. And Tokeny is actually one of our STG preferred partners, and they confirm that you know the expectation is for the Euronext to eventually be supporting tokenized securities. So I think that's a great move, and I just think it's very interesting that at the end of the day, if Euronext is able to do this successfully, there's no reason why parent company ICE won't look at this and, and see the success and hopefully maybe translate that over to the NYSE. You have to think that they're, they're behind this to a large degree. They're... You know, here in the U.S., they haven't fully ventured into tokenized securities or security tokens yet, but they are going live with BACT, which has to do with Bitcoin futures and a lot of crypto. So you have to think that they're starting to think about what this might look like in the U.S. and potentially scaling this even around the world eventually. So I totally agree. This is a huge, this is a huge vote of confidence from them in tokeny as well as in in security tokens in general. So this is a big one. Fully, fully agree. Liechtenstein, another European jurisdiction, uh, actually also has two exchanges in it. Most hmm. people wouldn't have thought. One of them is called Block Trade, which we, of course, mentioned earlier in the episode being acquired by Cryptics AG. Uh, there is no news around when they are going to be live. But the other exchange, LSX, the Liechtenstein Cryptocurrency Exchange, or probably at soon some point the LSX, um, also has announced that they are looking at security tokens and expect to be in the game very soon. Hmm. Now, and very soon, in, in again, terms of exchanges, likely not next quarter, likely not even this year, but one can hope and one can root for them for sure. Estonia, always recognized as a very forward-thinking, digital-friendly environment, launched a DX exchange out, out of Estonia, which also you know, was popular when they announced that they would be matching NASDAQ stocks with tokens that would be purchasable on the DX exchange. They, I think they ran into some difficulties there and are no longer doing that, but they're partnered with Marketplace Securities um, who will you know, generate ERC-20 tokens with corresponding rights to the stocks. And the, the concept is that you can buy these tokenized securities through the DX as opposed to, as we mentioned to you, going through the difficulty in the process of trying to go to the U.S. markets and purchase them there directly. So very interesting move, and I'm sure that they will expand themselves to be able to list other types of securities and the like, although that's not confirmed, at least not on our side. So you know, DX exchange out of Estonia, one to, to keep your eyes on. The last region in Europe that we're going to cover right now is Belarus, where they have currency.com launching a tokenized securities exchange aiming to facilitate the adoption of security tokens around the world, live with a token issuance uh, that essentially very similarly mirrors traditional securities in the U.S. market. They'll be working with their sister firm, Capital.com, which is another platform regulated by the FCA, as well as also the SISEC, the Cyprus Securities and Exchange Commission, to offer users access to a tokenized version uh, of these equities, commodities, or, or indexes. So another trend that we're seeing here, Kyle, uh, specifically in Europe, and reinforcing what we were just saying, right? European investors want access to U.S. Uh, assets. 
It's a very interesting idea that you can take a cryptocurrency and relate it one to one with a purchased stock in from the New York Stock Exchange or NASDAQ. And because those are tied together, it would mirror the same returns as long as there's the legally binding contract between the two. It's an interesting idea. It is a security token because you're talking about an asset backed token. And I think it's a great start because it's something that investors can easily wrap their heads around, can understand how this process works. And it allows, I think, volume to generate some capital for these exchanges so that they can then really begin to explore some of the more trend setting or groundbreaking applications. So a lot, especially for a lot of these smaller uh, financial jurisdictions, I think it's a fantastic first foray into this space. Um, yeah, absolutely. But uh, that ends the European segment. I am going to pass it over to you, Kyle, for our next stop on the tour in Africa. I, I understand that. I think we actually need to take a boat for this one. We're getting uh, on a boat. Forward, lo- learning more. We're taking some tiny islands here. Uh, we're starting with, with one of our favorites here on the show, Seychelles. Seychelles is, has their Merge Exchange, which currently has 31 traditional securities on the platform, and their total market cap is around $300 million. They did announce recently that they have plans to IPO later this year in the form of a security token offering. So they're, they're really trying to consider how they can leverage this opportunity. Hopefully, if they can successfully IPO with a security token offering, they can then begin to transition to offering other security token offerings on their exchange. So they're certainly aware of this, but you know, the degree in which they're actually providing these services yet, I think is, is, is we're not quite there yet. I, I think we all remember Seychelles, and at the end of the day, they're taking advantage of the fact that they are in Africa, and more importantly, as a, a little tiny island, uh, really they said they claim that they have the opportunity to really revamp the regulations to be the most conducive for security tokens, so very interesting to see what will happen there. From there, we are moving to Mauritius, and Mauritius is honestly an island, Herwig, that I was not incredibly familiar with prior to doing this research. But you were with Seychelles? <laughs> <laughs> certainly we've discussed Seychelles a, a few times throughout our, our 10 weeks. Uh, I certainly had not mentioned Mauritius before. I did need to look up how to pronounce Mauritius <laughs> prior to this episode. But that being said, they're doing great work, so it should not, should not hold them back at all. Um, we announce, or we see here that HYBSE and GMEX, they launched the international marketplace with the intention of trading tokenized securities. So this is a, a first option. I think a bunch of players in Mauritius are, are looking to, to leverage their joint capacities to be able to launch an exchange, hopefully to trade tokenized securities in the future. We also see there is a second security token exchange wow. in Mauritius. This second one is called the Global Asset Exchange, and they announced themselves loudly in March of 2019, saying that they are developing an exchange out of Mauritius and are looking to to leverage security tokens and offer those to investors. So two exchanges are very ambitious out of Mauritius and and deserve all the applause in the world because there's, there's a lot of barriers there in terms of their market cap and their GDP and the production there. But it's, it's a tremendous opportunity for some of these small islands to successfully, you know, be in the forefront. Wow. Two, two exchanges, one small island. With, uh, you know, they, they do have a population of around 1.2 million. Uh, at the end of the day, Seychelles is a lot smaller, as I understand it. So it looks like there's a little bit more room for, for two here. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll see. Best of luck for, for all of for, for those guys. And, and uh, we're excited to see the progress that they make. Moving forward into the Caribbean, we have Jamaica. Jamaica, they launched their stock exchange. They, they put out a, a strong press pump that they are working with Blockstation to pilot to trade security tokens. So the first stage of the pilot was included them you know, participating in with registered broker-dealers and market makers and the Jamaica Central Securities Depository. And so they were all they were trying to figure out how exactly all this stuff would work together. But according to their, uh, their official announcement, the objective of the pilot was to demonstrate a complete life cycle of the digital asset ecosystem. And so they started with crypto. I think that they're looking to move forward into security tokens, but they're, they're still working on it now, but they're doing a, a good job in terms of working with established players and, and, and going from there. 
All right, Jamaica. Moving forward into Curacao, we, we don't have a ton of information of, from Curacao other than we know that Comp Token, which is formed by Zeneca Group, has partnered with the Dutch Caribbean Stock Exchange in Curacao to list tokenized securities. So moving forward, that could be a great opportunity for issuers to be able to leverage the Dutch Caribbean Stock Exchange to, to be able to get some liquidity for their shares and, and be able to list successful security tokens in, in just another jurisdiction, which I think, again, highlights why it will be important to have all of these jurisdictions operate in collaboration because we have a lot of these jurisdictions all around the world, big and small, from the U.S. and the U.K. all the way to some of these smaller nations like Curacao or Seychelles. And so we need to make sure that everyone's okay with working together and we set the standards that we can all follow such that many of these issuers from all around the world can, can have access to liquidity. But finally, we're, we're going to another country here, Barbados, the Barbados Securities or Stock Exchange announced in early 2019 that it also has a partnership with Blockstation to help it build out support for security tokens. So we haven't heard any news since. We do see that Blockstation is, is really making big yeah. moves to work with many of these smaller nations to figure out how they can leverage security tokens in their exchange, in their their countries and, and be able to provide that to investors. So great for Barbados to be forward thinking, but we're looking forward to seeing a little bit more from them in terms of, of how that progress has looked so far. Finally, last but certainly not least, we have Asia. We cannot forget about Asia. No way. You're going to take us out of our tropical element here and go across the world here. All right. If, if we, we know Asia has been a leader in the crypto markets, they certainly are very forward thinking technologically. And we, we you know, are, are sure that they're making great moves with security tokens. We certainly are very aware of security tokens in all of Asia. Um, and so starting with Singapore, Singapore leads the region in activity. They have already greenlit an exchange by regulators in Singapore that's called One Exchange that's planning to launch several offerings in Singapore. And there's actually another exchange in Singapore formed by a joint venture between Zilliqa and MyCon, MyCoin rather, and it's called HG Exchange. And it's aiming to provide access to high growth startups and also decacorns. So We've heard this model before where they, they kind of provide secondary services for a lot of these large private companies. Examples that they say state in their announcement include Uber, which is now no longer public, um, SpaceX, Grab, and Didi, which are currently not within reach of the average investor. And so um, they're doing a great job there looking to, to list private companies and, and provide an exchange for them. Another exchange is called iStocks, and it's owned by ICHX, and it intends to be trading in 2020. And finally, one of the biggest cryptocurrency exchanges in the world, Wobi, which is also out of Singapore, did infer in July that they would are very much inclined to enter into the security token trading under the Singapore jurisdiction. So just like Binance, another large exchange obviously is plugged into the space, certainly sees the immense opportunity in security tokens, but recognizes the regulation, that the steps that need to take action there. And they, they have indicated that they're interested, they're monitoring the space and, and may, may be very likely to get involved a lot of activity out of Singapore, Kyle. I think that was four different exchanges you just mentioned. That's that's a lot. Singapore is making making some really really good moves. Then we go to Philippines, and the Philippines we have Cezex, the C E Z E X exchange based out of the Philippines, which is partnered with a Hong Kong broker dealer to build one of the first security token exchanges in Asia. Currently, they are actually trading a digital gold token which can be redeemed for 100 grams or 1,000 grams gold bars that they actually have in a vault. So they actually are, are trading what appears to be, Herwig, a, a real security token in the sense of when I was doing the research, it seems like if you own enough of this 
specific digital gold offering that they're providing on their platform, you're able to redeem that for a gold bar and show up in person and actually get your gold. And so this token is is representative of some amount of real gold. And, and so they're, they're also strongly planning to list many more security tokens moving forward. But as with many of these other exchanges on the list, there's a lot of regulatory clarity that, that needs to be established before that realistically can happen in terms of company equity or debt instruments or things like that. So good for Cezex using a Hong Kong broker dealer, which transitions us well into Hong Kong itself. Hong Kong, we have Diginex, which is an institutional grade platform intending to facilitate exchange and custody of tokenized securities and is based out of Hong Kong. And so previously, regulators in Hong Kong told many of the crypto exchanges to delist security tokens. But in March of this year, they actually released guidelines to follow for security tokens and to make sure that you're compliant. And it appears that Diginex now aims to be the new home for security tokens in Hong Kong, which is fantastic. And uh, we look forward to seeing the advancements there. But we also see that in Hong Kong and Singapore, there is a lot of activity. China, we, we haven't seen quite as much security token based activity there. Um, so we're, we're still looking and, and still very much paying attention to the space to see how this grows over time. But certainly there's a ton of activity in, in Asia still with ICOs and cryptos, especially with some of the large exchanges like Binance actually announcing that you can no longer participate as a U.S. investor. I think that goes live in about a week. So they're still very much into the, the crypto space and, and are, are slowly coming around to security tokens. And my end of the tour wraps up here with Australia. And Australia, from our news earlier down under, we know that the Australian stock or securities exchange is also planning to be completely on-chain by 2021. So they're, as Herwiggy mentioned, they're looking to, to get a lot of this data on-chain through distributive ledger technology. And we'd expect that considering this is their, their kind of the first step, it may be likely that in some way or another, tokenization of some of their equities or listing some tokenized equities or debt instruments may roll out moving forward, maybe in the 2021, maybe 2022, somewhere in there, we can kind of expect to see Australia maybe take a look. I know that Australia is incredibly active on the ICO front and are incredibly bullish on blockchain in general. So it, it doesn't seem like a far stretch for me to see them getting into this industry once we start to see an increased amount of successful offerings and potentially secondary interest from other parts of the world. Well, one would expect, Kyle, and I'm sure that we might see Australia very big space. Uh, I'm sure we'll see more entrants come into that region as well. Now, finally, uh, we do, you know, I'll, I'll try to circle us back to the other side of the world here. And unfortunately, we weren't able to find any dedicated activity from a, you know, a specific security token exchange planning to launch in Latin America as of right now. Certainly a lot of focus around crypto exchanges. We know that Tezos and BTG Pactual are, are doing big moves and you have BR11, which is a security token. But at the end of the day, it doesn't seem like there is, is anything specific that we can comment to that yet. And circling us back to North America, I can say that in Canada, uh, the, you know, the Canadian Securities Exchange, they announced in February of 2019 that they, they, they plan to launch a new securities token platform. And they've been very, you know, similar to the FCA, very forward thinking. They have a great sort of regulatory sandbox set up for all these uh, issuances and security tokens to be able to uh, go ahead and get listed. So uh, we, do, we do have our eye on Canada as our neighbor here. Uh, because at the end of the day, it is, it's outside of the U.S., so we, we could potentially see one of those easier correlations between two nations be Canada and the U.S. That ends our tour, uh, at least as of right now. I'm sure we'll end up doing another kind of update segment, taking a look at all this activity down the road and see how much of them are on track. Maybe some that uh, similarly get acquired like, like block trade or, or end up pivoting and doing something else. But I, I think it's worth commenting, Kyle, that you know, lot, even though we're seeing a lot of activity, none of them are live yet, it's clear that everyone's very bullish on the space. We see a trend that, especially the more 
proactive jurisdictions are seeing a lot more activity like the UK and Malta. And we're also seeing this trend of new regions or, or let's call it uh, you know, jurisdictions that previously didn't have a strong capital markets to begin with are looking at this new burgeoning technology and they see it as an opportunity to get in the game and potentially even compete at the highest level. You know, just like we saw with Seychelles or Barbados or any of the islands that Kyle took us through, it certainly is clear they all see the same opportunity. And of course, those jurisdictions that are you know reacting more so than, than being proactive, that things are a little slower there. But at the end of the day, it, it can't be stopped. We're, what, it, what is clear is around the world, everyone is looking at security tokens and recognizing the need for exchanges in the various jurisdictions and the opportunity uh, by these entrepreneurs or by the existing national exchanges, which I think is another major trend to recognize. These are not all startups getting into the game and further proof to us that here in the US, we expect the same thing. We will see national exchanges go after this. Kyle, your thoughts on, on all this? It's all very exciting. We're super early. But the reality is that it could be 2020 could be very interesting as all of these projects start to prop up. And, and we start to see a lot of these exchanges all around the world spending all this time fundraising and developing their technology and exploring the regulation and what they need to do to get this accomplished. Many of these exchanges all around the world will, I think, be ready around a similar time. And it's going to be an exciting opportunity when we really start to see the entire world connect in a way that, that has never been possible before. And I, I couldn't be more excited for what we're, we're going to see moving forward. So anyone listening from all around the world, do what you can to move your local jurisdiction forward and, and participate and collaborate with everyone else. Because this is a space where we're seeing a ton of collaboration from many countries all around the world, from many companies all around the world. And, and it's a great opportunity to get involved and to really make an impact locally and, and uh, globally. Really exciting. I think 2020 is for sure the year of the security token based on this information. We often like to say 2017, the year the year of the concept, 2018, the, the year everybody raised money to deploy, and in 2019 is that infrastructure year. So it's lining up right on track, 2020, the, the year of security tokens. Many exchanges will be live, many projects will be issued, lockups will be expired, and we're looking at exciting times ahead. That's all we have for the show. Thank you, everyone, for listening. As always, please send us your comments, feedback, and inquiries directly or you know, find us on any of our channels. Talk to you next week. Bye.